Hello, hello. Welcome back, everybody. Exodus 25. Now, I tried to do a bit of research ahead of time. Usually, I like to kind of do it free-flowing. Obviously, I've done, throughout my life, tons of reading and looking into deep dives on biblical scriptures and things like that. So I kind of just start from there and go in a free-flow fashion. But I really wanted to understand some things ahead of time. Because I don't like to edit my videos afterwards. And the main thing in Genesis 25, we're talking about the Ark of the Covenant. And I don't know why this fascinated me. It's probably because my dad is a geometry teacher. And I'm not all into the numerology and things like that. But the dimensions of the Ark of the Covenant, why the dimensions are important. I can't seem to find articles or anything that talk about the significance of the dimensions specifically. I don't know if there is a significance to it or not, but it seems like there would be. I just feel like there's everything significant for some reason. And maybe it's a simple reason, maybe it's a more complex reason, I don't know. But I want to know. So I don't normally read comments, but if anyone watches this and has some idea or where I can find why the dimensions of things are so important in the Bible, that would be great. Whether it's symbolic or not, it's just interesting to me. And that's the thing that I couldn't find. So that's why I'm asking for help. All right, we're going to read from the New International Version. It's easier for me to read. Uh, but I got my four translations here in my Bible so we can cross-reference if we need to. Exodus 25, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to bring me an offering. You are to receive the offering for me from everyone whose heart prompts them to give. So let's stop right there. First off, receive it for me. Now, in the commentary you'll find on this, it's a very specific here. You know, this one it's not, but the King James Version, it's capitalized me or my offering. Because still, and I went over this in earlier videos, the Israelites, and this is true for people in general today, are struggling with not worshiping in the material, in that it, to them they would revere Moses. They're giving the offering to Moses, and God's making it specific to Moses, so he makes it specific to the Israelites that this is for God. This is God's offering. I'm receiving it for him, but it's for God. You know what I'm saying? Because that's the big thing. We do it today. You know, how many people venerate the saints and the popes? How many people venerate a movie star or a fan? How many people venerate the material? You know, these men, these ministers who have, you know, huge millions of followers on TV and stuff, do you venerate that person or do you venerate God who that person's talking about? It's very easy for us to fall into this and the Israelites will see it time and time again. They, they kind of do this again. They worship somehow in the material and Moses is the easy one because he's the one that's talking to them through God, for God. So they become easily vent, able to venerate or blame him for all the problems or all the blessings. So the offerings that he wants to make sure that they understand these are for God, not for Moses. And then notice that it's all those whose heart prompts them to give. Other translations say those who willingly give. This isn't a forced thing. I mean, God's laws are enforced if you're going to live in his community here. But they're not going to make you give an offering. You might be shamed into it probably by your peers. But... God knows your heart. It's those who willingly are giving to him. Because he that's his whole thing. You have to come to him willingly. He's not going to force us to. You know, I hear it all the time from the atheists or from the non-believers, the questioners, that if God's so great, why does he allow bad things to happen? It's because we choose for bad things to happen. Maybe not you, but somebody made a sin and that ripple effect onto you. God told us not to sin. Sin hurts us. That's why bad things happen. And to say, why didn't he, he stop this from happening would be like, well, he did the Garden of Eden. Again, we chose not to. The only way you can really create a being that understands love is by giving him free will to choose to love. Because if you're forcing love, if you're forcing the love of God, then there's no free will and it's not real love. You have to freely choose him because that's the only way that love actually exists. Again, you can't force it. You can't have Stockholm Syndrome. That's not real love. You have to willingly do it. You have to willingly accept Christ. God gave us free will. Some of us choose to sin, which is, introduces negativity and bad things into our lives. But at the end of the day, 
He did it so that we would have free will. The alternative is for us not to have any free will, to be, you know, drones, okay? Off topic. Moving on. Verse 3. These are the offerings you are to receive from them. Gold, silver, and bronze. Blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and fine linen. Goat hair, ram skins, dyed red, and another type of durable leather. Acacia wood, I think it's acacia. Acacia wood, olive oil, and for the light. Spices for the anointing oil, and for the fragrant incense. And onyx stones and other gems to be mounted on the ephod and breast piece. Stop there or not. I'll, I'll keep going for a second. Then have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them, make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. You know, because we'll get more into depth for how it's supposed to look. But understand this. First off, all these offerings we'll see are going to be put to use. All right, they're not wasted. They're put to use to build this tabernacle, and it's a communal thing for those who willingly. So again, you'll hear arguments for people say like Jesus or the, is a communist or stuff like that. No, it's not forced. It's willingly given, and they will use this to build basically their church, their sanctuary, where the Ark of the Covenant and God will dwell among them. And we'll get into symbolism and what all these things represent. But one more thing that is overlooked that struck out to me one of the first I think first time I read my whole Bible was when I was like 12 or 13 and this stuck out to me that you know I remember the story of Christ talking about the rich man who gave a lot of money and the poor woman who gave a penny and it was all she had so she gave more God knows that not everyone has the same amount of means to give with but all these things he's asking for it doesn't matter your class in you know society as far as wealth or uh abilities to give is everyone will have something of this and god's asking for something you can afford to give but is also something you cherish because these are all like pretty cherishable things pretty nice things you know it's like uh <laughs> it's so dumb the equivalents we have today but you know because we have so many things say okay Bring me your laptop. Now, oh, I need my laptop. Okay, if you can't bring your laptop, give me one of your TVs. We only have one TV. Again, okay. Well, then bring me some of your nicest clothes. Again, you have to bring something of your best. Now, if you can't afford to bring, you know, let's say the gold, silver, or bronze, but you have some... Uh, yarn that you dyed you went and you collected the shells or you got the dry wood and you made the colored yarn that's a lot of effort you put a lot into it give it to god give your best that you can give willingly to god so he makes all kinds of different requests even the acacia wood that acacia wood it grew locally but you still had to go out and chop and uh mill the wood yourself so it takes some effort you're willing to do this thing, give up something material, or, and again, the physical labor is a part of the material world. You're willing to give up your time, your effort, your energy to go do this for God. doesn't matter what you can afford to give. We can all give something is what the point is here. All right, verse 10, the ark. Have them make an ark for of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long. Here are those dimensions. A cubit and a half wide and a cubit and a half high. Overlay it with pure gold, both inside and out, and make a gold molding around it. Cast four gold rings for it and fasten them to its four feet, and with two rings on one side and two rings on the other. Again, cause, I mean, whatever you want to call them, the Google algorithms or whatever, it's hard for me to find just articles about this stuff, about the dimensions and the symbology and all this thing. It's all just a bunch of, you know, like mainstream articles that are the first ones to pop up and I don't like wasting my time going and going and going but I know I've read and I've heard in past sorry I didn't take bibliography as I live my life but people talking about the symbolism of the dimensions the symbolism of what all this gold and everything represents it all has a meaning everything God does has a meaning and a purpose to it but again these people just came out of Egypt where 
symbolism was huge. You know, they, something had to represent something, and God understands the mind of his people. So again, they're giving their best. They're making something in the physical where they can go because he knows their minds need this. They need it. You know, by the time Christ comes, he removes the need really for any specific physical thing because the Holy Spirit enters into us. But he understood they needed this. They needed this in order to grow and understand what his true meaning and message was. But there is symbolism, like cast four gold rings and fasten them. All this has stuff to do with the way, like we'll see later with Ezekiel and all these prophets who are, and people who see like the glory of God's heaven and stuff. You'll it, it correlates a lot. All right. Then make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Insert the poles. Remember, it's make sure they understand that this is important. Since gold is seen as such a valuable thing, such an important thing, now they'll see it as being super important because they still need the physical to understand it. And we are still guilty of this today. All of us are. Uh, insert the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry it. You know, not only is it good symbolism, this is the way my dad always said it, it just is good construction. It's good engineering. You know, my dad who built our house and everything, he just reads and he's like, yeah, you know, you to distribute the weight and all this stuff and the gold reinforced and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, the poles are to remain in the rings of this ark. They are not to be removed. Then put in the ark the tablets of the covenant law, which I will give you. Make an anointment cover of pure gold. Atonement, I'm sorry, make an atonement cover of pure gold, two and a half cubits long and a half and a cubit and a half wide, and make two cherubim out of hammered gold at the ends of the coven of the cover. Make one cherub on one side and the second cherub on the other. Make the cherubim of one piece with the cover at the two ends. The cherubim are to have their wings spread up upward overshadowing the cover with them. The cherubim are to face each other looking toward the cover. Place the cover on top of the ark and put the ark the tap and put in the ark the tablets of the covenant law that I will give you. There above the cover between the two cherubim that are over the ark of the covenant law, I will meet with you and give you all my commands for the Israelites. Alright so this specifically, this symbolizes kind of the way that God's throne looks in a lot of the way that a lot of the people who get revelations see it. The, it looks very similar to the, this outline of the Ark of the Covenant. You know, is very similar to the way that they see God in heaven. Now, of course, if you're a non-believer, you can make the argument that that's the way your mind would perceive it based on this description. But since this description came first, you know, it's kind of... Where did it come from? Did Moses just make this up? And then it, and then they brainwashed into them to look like that? You know, you could always make an argument one way or the other. But obviously, I tend to think that God was showing them, giving them an re initial revelation so that they would know him and know who he was when these later visions came to the prophets. Cherubim angels are one of the classes of angels. Now, seraphim uh, are the ones that look more a lizard like apparently you know uh and a lot of people think that these are the angels or the fallen angels from genesis 6 that came down and had sex with women made giants and these are the original pantheons and this is why so many cultures have like dragon worship and all this stuff you know winged feather plume winged serpents you know because that sounds a lot like the way the seraphim are described but the two highest class of angels are the cherubim and the seraphim and the cherubim look like i mean here, this is, they're weird. They're all weird. But here's a description of them. Cherubim feature at some length in the book of Ezekiel. In Ezekiel 1, 5 through 11, they are described as having the likeness of a man and having four faces, that of a man, a lion, an onyx, and an eagle. They also have wings. Uh, so cherubim specifically, not the four heads part, you know, because they do have one head of a man, are the way that, in the masses, we view them now. It's with the wings, the face of a man, the body of a man, blah, blah, blah. But they have four faces, forehead. You know, it's just like on all sides, there's a face. I mean, cool.
cool. <laughs> Which way would you look? All right. So again, it'll be a long time before I get to Ezekiel, but we'll see as we read through the Bible, or as you do, hopefully on your own, that this has this a lot of symbol symbolism. You can look back at this construction and description of the Ark and see how it references another thing, because that's one way that the Bible shows its legitimacy. You know, here, 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 here. The prophets describing the way Jesus would live and die and be resurrected, the way that he would be not born in Bethlehem to a virgin, denied, all this stuff. They had to say it ahead of time, otherwise it's like, doesn't seem legitimate. But if you say it ahead of time, then you show that it did happen late, way, way later on, or you show the symbolism here, and then later, before they could understand what that symbolism even meant, you see later on what it means. So they're describing something that they, they're building something they don't fully understand to later on see what it means. And it shows the legitimacy of that this came from God. All right. The table. Oh, hold on. I want to go to my commentary here just to check out a few things. And that was, yeah. The mercy seat was what we just read. Is what it's called. Oh yeah, atonement seat, mercy seat. The mercy seat, actually the lid of the ark, was to be made of pure gold and made with the sculptured figure of cherubim. In the picture provided by the Ark of the Covenant, it was given. It was as if God dwelt between the two cherubim and met Israel there. In Israel, cherubim symbolize God's attendant and message spirits. Psalms 104, 3 and 4. And so were not considered a breach of Exodus 24, which is no man worshiped him. So basically, this mercy seat where God would meet with them, this atonement seat, think about that name. Think about what it meant. They knew from the beginning that they were sinners. They knew they needed atonement. And this is where they would come for that from God. And there I will meet with you. God met with Israel in the sense that that he met with the representatives of Israel in peace because of the atoning blood on the Day of Atonement. All right, now we'll move on. Verse 23. Make a tablet of acacia wood, two cubits long, a cubit wide, and a cubit and a half high. Overlay it with pure gold and make a gold molding around it. Also make around it a rim in hand breadth, a rim a hand breadth wide, and put a gold molding on the rim. Make four gold rings for the table and fasten them to the four corners where the four legs are. The rings are to be close to the rim to hold the poles used in carrying the table. Make the poles of acacia wood, overlay them with pure with gold, and carry the table with them. And make its plates and dishes of pure gold, as well as its pitchers and bowls for the pouring out of the offerings. Put the bread of the presence of the put the bread of the presence of on this table to be before me at all times. Again, there's a lot of like ceremony that goes into this, and I view it in two different ways. I've, you know, we as a society can get. Well, not just us, just throughout the generations, throughout the eons, we can get too obsessed with the ritualness of religion, the rituals, the, you know, partaking in traditions and all that, without, and then forget what they mean and what they symbolize and what it represents. You know, you see it all the time, even with Christians today. And this is the one thing that I will say about this. There is importance to tradition and to ritual. There is. God wants it. But the importance is that it sets your mind right to understand that this is God, the reverence you need to have for God. It's not the ritual in and of itself, which is what a lot of people end up doing. You know, we can even say this for the Lord's Prayer. People don't even always think about the Lord's Prayer when they say it. They just say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy you know. But do you think about what that means? Do you analyze it? Does it put your mind in the right place to talk to God? Our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed, holy be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, not mine. You know, think about the words you're saying, and then your prayer will have more effect. You know, you won't pray for your will. You'll pray for God's will. You know, give us this day our daily bread. You won't. The worries of, you know, how am I going to pay off my 30-year mortgage will go away, and you'll just ask God to help you get through the day and to bless the day. Do you see? And the stress will go away. You'll feel better. It's not the ritual of saying the prayer. It's understanding the ritual. Same thing here. All this stuff is symbolism. It's to show the importance, the value, the legitimacy of God. But when you just begin to do the ritual in of itself, that's where, and you forget God's presence in it all, then it's lost all meaning. I'm not saying that's what's happening here. This is the beginning of it, obviously. All right, the lampstand. Well, actually, let's go to our uh, commentary here. Uh... The purpose of the table of showbread. On the table of showbread were set 12 loaves of showbread, literally bread of faces. This was bread associated with and to be eaten before the face of God. In the East, the table was always the symbol of fellowship. Thus, the people were reminded of the possibility created of constant communion with God. Mm, see, symbolism. Uh, showbread, presence bread, bread is necessary for survival, and the link was a reminder that fellowship with God was just as necessary for a man. You know, I always say that when I have to do the meditation at church for our, uh, communion, to remember that, you know, just as our bodies need nutrients from bread and from the wine, so too does our spirit need to commune, to come to Christ, to come to God. See, it's representing something. That's why I have such a and it doesn't heat me up or anything, but I, I don't, it's just kind of annoying to me when people talk about how the wine actually becomes the literal blood of Christ. Like you're missing the, you're missing it. The point isn't that you're eating his body and drinking his blood. The point is that you are realizing he, him, Christ, is as necessary to our survival as eating and drinking. It's the same. Your spirit will not survive. You will not survive without Christ. You will wither away, just as you will without nutrients, without food, without bread. All right. Let's move on. Make a lampstead. Verse 31. Make a lampstead of pure gold. Hammer, uh, hammer out its base and shaft and make its flower-like cups, buds and blossoms of one piece with them. Six branches are to extend from the sides of the lampstand, three on each side and three on the other. Three cups shaped like almond flowers with buds and blossoms are to be on one branch, three on the next branch, and the same for all six branches extending from the lampstand. And on the lampstand, there are to be a there are to be four cups shaped like almond flowers with buds and blossoms. One bud shall be under the first pair of branches extending from the lampstand, a second bud under the second pair, and a third bud under the third pair. Six branches in all. The buds and the branches shall all be of one piece with the lampstand, hammered out of pure gold. Then make its seven lamps and set them up on it so, they, so that they light the space in front of it. Its wick, trimmer, its wick trimmers and trays are to be of pure gold. A talent of pure gold, which is just like an amount, is to be used for the lampstand and all these accessories. See that you make them according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. Again, he's telling God, this is coming to Moses before he even goes to the mountain and gets all this information. It's all going to be shown to him. He's going to get the Ten Commandments, etc. Now, the lampstand is one I had to read up on because I was like, I didn't get it all. <sighs> all right, so let's see here. This is in the commentary on Enduring Word Bible. You know, like I said, they're all right. They don't go in as depth as I'd like, but... You shall also make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand was hammered out of gold with no specific dimensions given, but after a, the pattern of a mold, menorah. 
So the bulls shaped like almond blossoms on the branches. Uh, so this tree was the first to blossom in springtime and it reminds everyone of new life and the fresh nature of God's ongoing work. A glance at any reproduction of the arch of Titus will make the main outline plain. Although the exact metaphorical sense of some of the technical terms used is not quite clear. See, like that's not that great a commentary. You shall make seven lamps for it. The tabernacle represented the court of God's throne, and Revelations 4 5 describes seven lamps of fire where burning were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. The seven lamps represent the presence of the Holy Spirit in heaven. Seven spirits of God, you know, this stuff isn't really talked about because it gets into like, oh, is this uh, polytheism? It's like, no. See, that's the thing. The deeper you go into the spiritual, the more firm you have to be on God being God. <laughs> you know, because, of course, when you want to try and understand more and more, it's going to get more in-depth and a little more confusing. The seven spirits of God, it's kind of like an opposite of the seven deadly sins, you know? But that's not important. The point is that that's what these lamps represent. And again, it's all symbolism for people who really want to dive deep into the Bible and really want to dive deep into God's spiritual world. You can look to confirm the legitimacy of the scriptures because of the way that long before these revelations came to people, it was being described in the way that God was having them build uh, his sanctuary, the dimensions, and the way it was to be built, and all these things. Also, they need a lamp because the tabernacle uh, itself was completely covered tent. The only source of light was the lamps. Uh, the symbolism here says might be that of the light which God's presence brings to his people, rem uh, remembering that light in the Old Testament is also a symbol of life and victory. Makes sense. Again, not that in-depth of commentary. But... If you want to dive deep to understand exactly what all the symbolism represents, go for it. It's fun. It's kind of hard to find it all, especially anymore. That's what's annoying. Because back before I joined the Navy, you know, in like 2011, you could find all this stuff just by Googling it. And then it's like I, I went away for a couple of years <laughs> with limited internet access. And I came back and I'm like, where did all these articles go? Where did everything I used to be able to find easily go? It's just annoying the way it happened that way. But understand, the symbolism isn't necessarily what's important, that, but it will make reading your Bible more interesting. Because if you're reading this and you don't care about symbolism, you don't care about this stuff, these are the skip over chapters of the Bible. These are the ones like, it's not really telling a story. It's not really giving you a historical uh, reference. It's not really <clears throat> giving you a message unless you get the symbolism. So these are the ones where people are like, oh, the Bible's so hard to read. It's so boring. I get it. Trust me, I read it long before I understand what any of the symbolism was. And I was just like, geez. I, I, to me, it was just like reading <laughs> the manual you get on how to put something together when you buy it from Home Depot or something. Like it was just, okay, you know, like, why am I reading this? This is so boring. Why do they, why they even put this in here? You know, this is how they built it. Great. Who cares? You know? But then as you go on, you'll see that it has represented. It represents something. And people need this sort of representation. It's so long as they know what it's representing. And that's my main message that I get from this. Is remember what you're doing and why you're doing it. You know, why are you praying? Are you praying because you want a wish list? from like a magic genie? Are you praying because you revere God and you want his grace and his salvation and his guidance? I mean, we can say this for everything. When you take the communion, are you remembering how important it is to come to God, give time to God? When you go to church, are you remembering how important it is to take a day off in remembrance, and meditation and prayer, and devotion to God, to revitalize you, to go out and work for the rest of the week because God respects hard work he, won't, he values it. It's a virtue. So 
Are you know, do you know why you're doing the things you do, or are you just doing them because the Bible tells you to? That's the main thing I get from Genesis or Exodus 25. Remember why you're doing what you're doing. All right, everyone have a wonderful afternoon, evening, or good night. God bless.